Hello everyone and welcome to the another episode of the React Native Show podcast. Today we have a very special guest and very special topic that I've been wanting to do for a long time. So our guest today is Lorenzo from Microsoft who will say his surname himself so that I so that I don't butcher it. Hello Lorenzo, good to have you on the show. Hey, Lucas, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, I know, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't uh, make it easier for everyone. Sadly, it's a very like Italian surname, as a lot of the S, the C, the I. So uh, my, surname, my surname is Chandra. Like uh, the, the, the easiest way to think about it usually is like, uh, like Sha, like the encryption. Like that, that, that's, that's, that's the only thing I can suggest to people whenever they try to pronounce it. It's just like Sha. Yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, can... I'm happy to be here. Everyone can find you on the internet uh, by the name of Kelset, correct? Yeah, yeah. That that was a, a lucky uh, typo that I made a very long time ago. Uh, when it, still in my teenage years during D and D sessions, and like uh, I liked that name and it kind of stuck with me. And then I realized years later, oh, I actually wanted to copy a name of a character, but I typoed it when I wrote yeah. it for myself and so it became unique and in that way it was like a blessing in disguise yeah lorenzo you are very active on twitter you are very active in react native space um so before we jump into react native at microsoft can you tell us some more about how long have you been involved with react native in general sure uh react native for me uh is something that started in a very uh confusing way in a sense like i was a ruby on rails developer in early like out of university uh, i joined a small company in turin back in italy and i was doing ruby on rails and at one point we were working for a client that wanted a mobile app and the team uh just like kind of dropped on me okay you you pick everything you pick the third stack everything we're gonna do you just decide which stack i was about to go uh with xamarin actually because from uni, oh, I had no. a bit more knowledge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah, I mean, literally, I was doing my internal presentation um, explaining like, hey, I've evaluated all these alternatives and it sounds like Xamarin is potentially the better one for what we want uh, to kind of like have this cross-platform experience. Um, and then uh, out of sheer luck, uh, it so happened that we shared office with a design studio that uh, their CTO, because it was a, it's a very peculiar design studio, basically, and they have an entire tech team and they have a very mm -hmm. smart CTO. And uh, basically was like, hey, actually, have you considered this other tech, React Native? And I never heard of it before. And luckily, he mentioned it to me. And from then, I've been using React Native like constantly. Uh, it, it's so the reason why I moved was to London. That? Do you remember? Oh, uh, that was probably end of 2015 or early 2016 yeah, yeah it was so more or less very around early days yeah it was right after they announced react native for android so uh it was the perfect timing because if you if i explore react native before they announced android i would have probably said oh this is ios only so it's not really uh what it's not I'm really multi-platform <laughs> yeah exactly yeah no, yeah yeah oh my god it, it's so long i, I everything before the pandemic is kind of squashed, but like that yeah. phase in particular feels so far away. Well, it's also like seven years ago at this point, six, seven years ago. So yeah, it, it is seven years ago. So mm -hmm. uh, at that time, seven years ago, uh, besides from multi-platformness, what was the most important thing in React Native that got you hooked on this technology? Um, my ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I think it, it was very uh, an interesting challenge. Like I was out of uni, I was just, I literally had no idea what I was doing the entire time. And I was like, oh, cool, this is a different tech. This is JavaScript. Uh, I, I noticed that React was very popular. I was like, oh, maybe this is an interesting challenge. And then what I quickly realized is that um, JavaScript is way faster and way easier than, you know, uh, Xamarin use C Sharp, which like for a big production app, like C Sharp is a way more 
well structured languages, type safe and everything. But like for young old, young silly old me, um, you know, it, it was kind of like very interesting to be able to be that fast. Like, oh, I can just type a variable and I don't even need to say what type it is. I can just throw it around and see what you know what happens. And if it crashes, I just need to you know make sure if number or something like that. <laughs> it, it was that kind of like uh, <laughs> yeah. velocity that really kind of hooked me in and the expressiveness. I really like. JSX, uh, I don't, I, I'm probably in the minority on this, but like uh, as someone that used Ruby on Rails before, which was very like, like, you know, a full stack solution that like brings all together all at once. I didn't have any like preconception of like, oh, web needs to be done this way, front end needs to be done this way. So to me, like React Native was my gateway into JavaScript. I didn't know any JavaScript before that. I must say uh, your perspective is very different, very distinctive from what I hear from other people. So if you had to choose between the Xamarin and React Native, you say it's the JavaScript language. And most people would say, because React Native is like truly native under the hood, and we can we have to live with JavaScript, but your answer is not JavaScript, it's just faster to iterate, faster to, um, to do the MVP that you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I was literally just out of uni. I had no concept <laughs> of like what a decent product should have been. I, yeah. I think this project is actually dead. Like, I, I don't think it survived a year after I left that company. So, but you know, it's that's what happens when you work with startups with uh, very small companies. But no, yeah, I, so, I think it was great for that. So right now we are seven years later from that point, and right now you work at Microsoft. So can you tell us something about? Uh, what you do at Microsoft? Th that, that's a th that's a good question. Like I ask myself that very question like every other week, because uh, right now I'm in the Office org. Uh, like Microsoft, being such a massive company, basically internally has an entire series of like w what we call organizations. Basically, uh, companies that are dedicated to certain products. Like for example, there's the Azure one, there's the Xbox one, there's Office. Uh, so currently, I'm on the Office, and in particular, I'm part of a team that works in the cross-platform experiences. Uh, what that means is that we create the foundation so that other teams of developers can build uh, experiences. So let's say, uh, like I think the modern commenting experience you have, like when you open Office in Word, for example, and you add a comment, I think that entire part of the experience, like how you write a comment, the fact that the comment shows up where it shows, like that's entire React Native. Uh, so basically, there are bits and pieces in these massive brownfield apps that are made with React Native. And my team, my side of the organization is what creates the tooling that enables that. Uh, in particular, just like silly old me, uh, what I do is try to do whatever I feel like it's the best thing to do to make React Native better. Oh, awesome. Which That's can a be, great job. Yeah, it, it's kind of like all, all, all and nothing. But like, for example, what I've been doing this week is trying to figure out a way to make uh, like an end-to-end -end pipeline work with Jest, um, like using just Jest as the testing system, basically. So I use Jest, Appium, WebDriver.io, because right now me and some folks from Meta have been discussing, hey, we need to improve the, the CI on the GitHub repo. So... Yeah, basically, I do what needs to be done at the moment in time to help React Native thrive. So that's why also I still do releases. It's now like part of my official job. Like usually, uh, before I joined Microsoft, like it was always like a side gig kind of thing. It was always like, oh, in my free time, in my extra hours, I would work on the releases, test the releases uh, with Mike mm -hmm. and Grabowski. So um, yeah, no, it, it's. I think it's a peculiar position to be in. Uh, it's also very weird also, you know, because you're not, for example, working on a single project all the time. So it's a bit harder to evaluate how things are going. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I've been doing this thing that potentially like in six months will give us a return of investment and it will make more sense. But like now I've been doing it for long enough that we're actually starting to see some of that. So it, it, it's it's a good time for me to be doing this and not feel like too demoralized that nothing makes sense. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And thanks for your work, actually. Like, uh, if I had to describe what you do is you work on Microsoft R React Native products, related products. You work on React Native core experience. And then you show up on podcasts and on conferences. And then you are active uh, on Twitter uh, talking about community uh, uh, and reaching the community with some of the things that you do in your uh, open source space. And uh, so, okay, um, I think we can move on to our uh, main topic for today, which is React Native at Microsoft. So you uh, spoke something about uh, that React Native is in Office, but let's go back to the beginning and um, maybe you can speak something to how was React Native even introduced to Microsoft. So I will give you some of my thoughts. Several years ago, I was playing with this um, multi-platform technology called React XP, <laughs> which I discovered several years ago, which was basically like React, but with different API that worked both on mobiles and on, uh, and on web. And then I discovered that it was actually created by Microsoft. So how did you end up with using React Native and not this this um, React XP that actually Microsoft created back then. Oh yeah, that, that's that's a great way to start the conversation because it's actually very hard. Like uh, uh, one of the things that I was trying to do, like in my first six months, was actually like this archaeological work to try and figure out, okay, who started it? <laughs> like wh where <laughs> React Native first started at Microsoft? I was there with my Indiana Jones hat, like trying to go through all the archives and stuff, and what it looks like is that it was kind of like a grassroots effort. Like many very passionate engineers in different parts of the company kind of like all started thinking about React Native and using React Native um, at, more or less around the same time. So I would guess it's more or less the same time I started using it. Uh, like second half of 2015, I think that's probably when... Uh, the first React Native code appeared within Microsoft, potentially even a bit earlier than that. But basically, it was like many different teams of engineers that started using it in their own projects. And yeah, React XP was, I think, the most uh, uh, outspoken one at that point in time because Skype was very bullish around React Native, yeah. and they were like, "Okay, this is a great idea. It just needs a bit of a of a hat on top." So that's why they created React XP, and. Yeah, I, I think that Skype was the first org to kind of like bat a lot on React Native, but surely they weren't the first. Like, I, I think that what they did was like create, a, let's say, a, a first like massive drop of water in the lake, and the ripple effect kind of like gave more confidence to the other teams to also build more with React Native. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's. It, it, it's likely that it's a scenario where, like you know, uh, smart people come to the same uh, you know uh, results by going through different paths. That, that's mm -hmm. that's what I feel happened. And yeah, I mean, React XP right now is actually uh, it's been archived entirely. I'm pretty sure because uh, it's not needed anymore. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, right now there are multiple places across the company that use React Native. Yeah. Yeah, because what, what it was is like um, bridging solution uh, over React Native from one side and React from another side and giving them the unified API. And right now we can do the same in React Native with React Native Web and with other solutions as well. So we don't need the, the middleman there. We can go directly to yeah. React Native. Um, so answer to the question, how was React Native introduced to Microsoft is it was introduced several different times by several different people all at the same time. And right now yeah, there are several products that use React Native in some parts of another. Um, yeah, <clears throat> we, we use it. it. It's wild because we, we kind of like took the core idea of React Native and kind of ran with it. So we have apps, we have different platforms, we have different devices and different tooling. Like we, we, we really like expanded on the core idea of React Native and like run with it in many different ways. Oh yeah, so maybe we can go one by one. So what I know, what I know that you do 
and correct me if I'm wrong, but like you said, you have applications, Greenfield and Brownfield, written in React Native. You maintain two huge forks of React Native, React Native Windows, obviously, but also React Native Mac OS. And apart from all that work, that is not enough for you. Uh, you are also maintaining some developer experience tools for React Native developers so that this, um, this solution is easier for people to use. So let's start with apps. Uh, can you list some of the most important, the biggest apps that use uh, React Native, either Brownfield or Greenfield? Sure, let's start from there. Um, so for the interest of time, I'll keep it short. <laughs> but I think that the, the, the five probably most famous one that we can mention here that are using React Native are Outlook Mobile, Teams Mobile, and Office Mobile. So, you know, those small apps that no one uses. And uh, in this case, they're all, uh, they're all brownfield apps. So it means that there was a pre-existing app and then we added uh, React Native experiences and parts of the apps on top of it. And then we have more greenfield solution like the Xbox Game Pass app and the Skype app. Like those are also like pretty popular apps that uh, I've, you know, uh, started using React Native uh, in very, in very like you know, very extensive ways, and not only for the mobile apps. Like for Xbox, I'm pretty sure that uh, also the desktop app is using React Native, through React Native Windows is uh, is using React Native basically. And similarly, recently we even announced that we've put React Native through React Native Windows into Windows 11. Like if you go into your account settings, I think that entire page is all React Native, and it's so not the there only is one. actually a part of React uh, of Windows, <laughs> not an app, but operating system Windows that Indeed. everyone knows that is written entirely in React Native. That's huge. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm probably like butchering things here. Like, <laughs> it, uh, technically, you could call the settings app a, an app and not technically part of the operating system. So yeah. I'm just going to say it so that people will not you know, come at me with beach boards like, ah, that's not what iOS is. Because I, I still have PTSD from like my, I, I had a course in uni that was like operating systems. And I, I, I just remember that it was the worst thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, OK. So it is an app. It's, a, it's an app within. Uh, I guess Windows technically it's an app within yeah. Uh, Windows, yeah. So uh, to some context about the, the Office apps, we actually had this same discussion about Office apps, uh, I think, two or three months ago on some conference. And I remember we've been discussing that the Office application suite is so huge, the code base is so huge that you can find several different technologies playing with each other since like early 2000s or even before that. And then on top of that, you are adding this React Native uh, snippets, React Native add-ons to it. And I remember from our last year conference, React Native EU 2021, uh, there were some people from Microsoft that were discussing how it's all built. So you have this huge monorepo and then this one snippet, like you said, a comment uh, in like Word, comment in Excel. This is only written once, and then it's distributed to those two different applications. Uh, let's link that um, conference talk in the show notes. But can you speak uh, some of that? Can you can you add some context to what I just said? Yeah, uh, basically. I mean, th this is one of the core, um, you know, benefits of React Native when you start looking at massive companies. Like, if you have multiple apps, multiple experiences, multiple, you know, versions of your app, you want your user to be able to flawlessly move between, you know, the desktop app, the mobile app, uh, between, you know, from the browser on their laptop to their, you know, working machine. Like, one key idea is, you know the experience should feel the same, should feel familiar. It should still like be part of like the operating system you're in. So it's, if it's Android, it should still feel Android. It should still feel, you know, Windows, whatever. But at the same time, you want 
the person to be like, oh, if I click on this avatar picture, this card will show up and it will show the name of this person, right? Yeah. And once you start looking at things from that perspective, then it's like, can I just you know write this code once? Can I can I make it happen somehow? And then that's where React Native comes in, right? Because at that point, if you can uh, create a your app in your native language, whatever your brown feed app, you add a thin layer on top, and then you put this, you know, uh, shared elements. written ones yeah. experience. Uh, then all of a sudden you have a way more consistent experience across all these different apps. Like I'm pretty sure, in particular, like in Teams Mobile and in Outlook Mobile, we either have started or it's already rolled out. Like precisely what I'm talking about. Uh, the the fact that if you click on the avatar, the page that shows up, it's it should be the same at least on some of the platforms, and that's because the code is quote unquote written once. There's still an asterisk to put there because what what ends up happening is usually that you still need to write like the UI slightly, like you have multiple mm -hmm. files, you write the business logic and the data layer once, and then you need to write like a I don't know like card.android.js, card.ios.js, just so that it respects more the yeah. um, the OS, uh, you know, UI visual patterns. But yeah, no, it's it, it's very peculiar how we are managing, and and it's something that we are still improving over time. Like how we're able to like write the experience with within one team and then distribute that experience to multiple different apps. Yeah, for me, it is so mind bending that you have this huge, huge repositories and you are using the same technology that I use uh, for writing my like weather application or something that you can, you can do it once and then distribute it to like millions and millions of people to like tens and tens of products. That's, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, uh, Maybe I will add some one more comment to what you said previously. And I think not many people know that. And so from the beginning, uh, recently, uh, you were the one that added to showcase page on React Native Dev um, document, um, documentation. You've added some Microsoft products. Uh, so did you add it? Did you add the... Uh, Xbox applications there as well? Because I know that is not a common knowledge that Xbox applications are actually, uh, can be and are actually React Native applications as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, wh what we did was um, we have a, it, it's, it's surprisingly hard to get, uh, because React Native is used in so many parts of the company and the company is so huge, it's very hard to kind of like get all of them in a group chat and just tell, hey, can you can you give me yeah. approval to put your app in the store? So we kind of like had to select some of the big names. So I reached out to the Xbox folks and I was like, hey, is there any one app that you can just like give me a quick yes and I can drop into the showcase? And they were like, yeah, the, 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 the Game Pass app is probably like one of the easier ones. So. Mm -hmm. That's why we dropped it there. But yeah, it's it, I, I'm I'm constantly. I think I'm I'm I still don't understand like on, on a uh, on a on a rational level what I'm dealing with. Like like you know the fact that you were mentioned like oh you you write your code and then it goes into millions yeah. of uh, you know devices and uh, it, it, millions of users <laughs> use it and it's like. I don't think I still realize that. I, I think I'm still in this phase where like names are names. I don't really, I don't know. I still, <laughs> it, it's kind of wild. Like anytime well, I try to think about it, it my brain kind of like, nope. <laughs> yeah, because when you look at it, like if you are writing this weather application, okay, your code can break one application, maybe two, if you have like different flavors or something. If you write <laughs> some buggy code in Office snippet application, it will break <laughs> several different products. <laughs> you don't even. Yeah, know. and I mean that's why we have a test extensive, you know, testing oh, yeah. infras and CIs and <laughs> rollout strategies that like really try to minimize that. And you know, it's one of the big challenges, also because uh, with brownfield apps, there's always that extra need of you need to have someone that understands how these 
uh, you yeah. know, this thin layer that you've added manually on top to make it work works, and they need to upgrade it correctly anytime there's a new Arachnid release. So it's challenging, but I think it's the the fact that uh, you know Arachnid is it, it, still growing in usage and adoption across the company is really is really reassuring about the fact that it's a bet that makes sense for us in multiple scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thanks for the talking about the applications. Uh, let's move on and talk about platforms because like, like we said previously, you are maintaining two different uh, React Native forks. Can I call it them forks? Is, is, is there a better word for it? I think that for React Native Windows, the um, actually term is um, out of three platform. So platform. yeah, but okay. but React Native macOS is by all intent and purposes a fork. It's okay. yeah, it, it's uh, uh, they decided to go. So first off, uh, yes, we maintain both these macOS and Windows platforms because we we're like, okay, React Native makes sense. The approach of like writing JavaScript and then having some sort of wiring to connect it to the native code is good. Let's expand on that. So I think that React Native Windows was. Uh, the first one that we did in terms of like adding an extra platform on top. And reckoning Windows went through many iterations, but right now there is a team within Windows that is maintaining uh, it as this out of street platform. And what this means is that basically um, it only adds all the necessary code that you need on top of React Native Core so that you can quote unquote, talk to the Windows native code mm -hmm. or the native layer. So technically, um, it's in terms of from a developer's perspective, it's not as much of a head as maintaining a fork. Uh, yeah. Like in that sense, like macOS is is much harder to keep on, uh, you know, aligned. Like reckoning Windows, for example, is always on latest. And with macOS, we're I was trying going to get to say, the point. I'm really impressed. Mm -hmm with the speed and with the cadence of React Native Windows releases, because it's always like few days after the main repository releases new version. So I was yeah. really impressed with that. And it makes a lot of sense if you uh, think about it, what you just said, it, it's you're not changing the core files, you're just adding a new file. So you have to maintain only your files and the core files needs to stay the same in order for this yeah. to be as speedy as you want. Yeah, of course, it still has its own challenges. But yeah, in, in that sense, like uh, the Reckoning Windows team has found a really good also like automation on CI that they were able to apply so that they could like catch, you know, oh, this code is now changed in the in its logic. So we need to adapt it very mm -hmm. early thanks to um, a few years back, I think at this point, one of the um, Reckoning Windows maintainers, uh, Andrew Coates, he uh, basically worked with Meta to add uh, the concept of nightly releases to React Native Core. And React Native Windows uses this nightly feed of releases to kind of like test their code base and ensure that they can pick up uh, breaking changes very quickly. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. one of the ways they're, uh, they're, they're kind of and they're, you know, they deserve praise for how they managed to stay in sync with the release of Core. Also, because as the rec one of the React Native releases, releasers, I can say like we've been uh, going faster uh, in a way. So it's it's good that React Native, Windows, React Native Windows is capable of keeping up. Again, macOS on the other hand, uh, because it's a fork, is much more work. Uh, also, because basically the the idea with macOS originally was well, uh, it it just needs a few changes of the iOS files in a way, so that's why they decided to go for a fork and not like an out of three idea. Uh, but then it means that you know whenever there's something in the code that changes, you need to not only address the logic changes, but also like potential refactorings or restylings of the files. Like there was a Sometimes you have conflicts that you need to address just because you're a fork and not because of some of the code that you added, and mm -hmm. you know that that creates a lot of friction. And yeah, we're still working towards that. Like I think it's hard to see right now. I feel like from the outside, but we are trying to track like 
how long does it take for a certain release of core to become a release of macOS. And it's getting better. Like the, the team is working hard to um, to try and and get to the point where everyone is like, oh, when a new release of Arachnid Core comes out, also everything else uh, comes out too. But we're still working towards that. Yeah, but I can also understand that React Native Windows is your priority and you're just doing React Native Mac OS from the goodness of your hearts. <laughs> uh, Not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was going to ask you about this new um, trend in React Native, which is new architecture, which we all mm -hmm. hear about and all love and all are eager to implement. So can you speak something to how this effort is looking in React Native Windows, for example? Sure. So for React Native Windows, it's a bit of a, uh, a peculiar situation going on right now because basically um, the new architecture is one of the goals that the, the team has, but there's also a different one. Basically, they are changing the internal guts of React Native Windows, like what parts of the native Windows code it interacts with, which UI libraries it interacts with. So basically, right now we're using what is called System XAML and UWP. And now they're migrating that to the new Windows app SDK. So basically, these two changes are kind of happening at the same time. And because they are they, they kind of overlap a bit because the new architecture is all about how you communicate with the native layer. And if we're changing this native layer, it means that you know you kind of need to do one and then the other because if not, yeah, like, you need oh, new okay, bindings. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because it, it's kind of like you're kind of wasting time, right? If you're doing the, the <laughs> new bindings for the old parts and then, okay, it's perfect. It's done, boom, throw it out and now do the new ones again. So. Basically, of course, it's not as simple as that, but what we're doing is kind of like trying to make these two things happen at the same time. I think in particular in this second half of the year and the next year, that's where like most of the focus of the team for Racking the Windows is going to be. So it's hard to give a deadline right now or like uh, a target date of like, okay, at this point, Racking the Windows is going to be 100% ready. But I think um, they're going to try to do their best to, you know, make it all happen in a way that it's kind of like seamless, at least for the user, I hope so, yeah. Yeah. Um, my next question about React Native Windows is actually the usage of the repository itself. So how many developers uh, write apps in React Native Windows for React Native Windows? And also a second part of this question is, mm, the libraries, the um, open source libraries that they can use. So what is the, what I want to say, the usage of React Native Windows and like React Native Windows specific libraries? That's, I think it's a great question because it's also something that we sometimes wonder, even at the React Native core level, like because none of these open source projects have any telemetry, basically. It, <sighs> It would be much easier if we had like telemetry that you could opt in and say, "Hey, by the way, I'm using it," because yeah, that like way a you could pixel have somewhere there. Kind of, but you know, it's open source. Whenever an open source project has tracking, it always gets. You know, no, I, it was just. It, it's joking. always it's always a bit of a of a gray area. So we always wanted to keep out of it. I don't know. I think at some point we need to revisit this idea because it, it would be nice to get some actual numbers. What we know for React Native Windows in particular, is that uh, we have been uh, trying to see in the Microsoft Store how many apps uh, use React Native Windows. And we know for sure that there are hundreds. But aside from that, it's kind of like a bit uh, hard to tell. We The React Native Windows team is trying to also create better documentation, more accessible documentation so that people can get started way easier. Uh, if you go on the React Native Windows website, you, you'll find it easily. There are some blog posts in particular that try to really you know, take you by the hand and like, hey, this is how you do it. 
Uh, in terms of the libraries, let's say you start your React Native Windows projects, which library you can import and use, that's a bit of a, of a situation where we, we're we trying to figure out a balance still, because on one end, if you come at it from a perspective of, uh, you know, a React Native developer, maybe you already have your mobile app, you want to expand it to use Windows, let's say, um, because you're like, okay, my mobile app also wants a desktop app type of deal. Uh, what you will find is that probably not all of the libraries that you're used to using uh, work out of the box with React Native Windows. We've been trying to keep kind of a list of like very important libraries that we want to have Windows support. Like, for example, uh, React Native WebView. Like the web view is one of the most used libraries, I think, across the entire ecosystem. Yeah. And that one, uh, actually, a couple of uh, React Native Windows maintainers, uh, they are also maintainers of React Native Win web view, and they directly send PRs and, you know, ensure that the React Native web view supports Windows. But right now, it's, it's mostly like, it's something that we're actively trying to improve. Okay, thanks. So I think with that answer, we can actually wrap up our platform section and move on to yet another um, area that you are active, you as a Microsoft, in React Native space, which is developer experience tools. Can you say uh, what you are doing in this space? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's... You know, b because as we were talking about earlier, you know, uh, Windows and Office and Teams and Outlook, etc., like they're all using React Native. What uh, we quickly found is that some of the limitations of the approach of uh, React Native as it is uh, can bubble up very quickly. So we had to find ways to work around these challenges. And we came up with a series of libraries and extra tooling that we needed to add on top. For example, a classic one that, you know, the, the first ever issue on the Metro repository that was, you know, supporting lim sim links. That's something that we created an extra plugin for Metro 4 so that, you know, internally you can just use it because when you work in these massive monorepos, basically the, the there are some workarounds and ways you could you know, set up Metro to work within these scenarios without supporting symlinks directly. But for us, it's much more convenient to have this extra plugin. And what we've been doing uh, for the developer experience side of things is that we're, over time, we've been collecting all these different tools and commands that we've added in our libraries and repositories, and we've put them in uh, an, a GitHub repo that is open source for everyone to, you know, take a look at and use. And it's called our next kit. And basically, in there, uh, yeah, you will find most of these tooling. Like uh, another one, for example, is the uh, ES Build plugin for Metro. And what this does is that basically it leverages ES Build for bundling your app instead of Metro. And what that has is a tree shaking ability. So this means that it leads to smaller bundles. Like for for quite a long time, like. Um, and you know, your call stack folks have been creating this webpack base packaging yeah. uh, alternative for Metro. You know, whole first and now repack. And the the one of the great things about it is the tree shaking ability of uh, of yes. those libraries, which is why, like, even internally, we use whole for quite a long time. But then all got discontinued, and we were like, okay, is there a way we can actually make Metro perform? at that level, like, can, he, can we get it to get the bundles to be more or less the same size as what Hall and Repa can produce? And we found that through this ES build tool is, is actually uh, possible to reach that. It's not always necessarily as small as um, an equivalent one, but it's pretty close, so we are fairly happy with it. And it's not just that, like, we also have some more tooling that we are um, open sourcing, like the, the other big one that um, me and Tom Nguyen, which is a colleague of mine, we talked about it at React Native Europe last year, is called React Native Test App, which is basically... Yeah, I remember. Yeah, it, it, it's it's pretty magical how it works, but 
if you have a library, a React Native library, usually you need an example app to test your library against. And React Native test app basically removes all the frictions of having to maintain an, an extra app in your repository. It's, it, I honestly still have no idea how it works. It's just black magic to me. I just know that I can write a command and say, hey, bump it to the new version of React Native, bump it to 69 or 70 or whatever, and it just works. And I'm like, okay, this is perfect. Like you can just test your app. Like right now, it even supports the new architecture, so you can even test your library against Fabric and against the Turbo modules, which is, I think, we we really hope that more people will pick it up as a quick way to, you know, help them work towards having their libraries, uh, you know, work with the new yeah. architecture. So yeah, that, that that's also something that we're doing and. Just a quick shout out, then we can talk more about like how we're also involved in the developer experience space more in general. Uh, we also have some UI libraries open source for React Native. There's one in particular, which is called Fluent UI, which is basically our design system. And that library is also an interesting use case. Like they use React Native to stop to, they have one single React Native to stop and that deploy like you, you can test it on windows mac os ios and android so it, it, it it's very a, a very interesting monorepo to look at from like a technical perspective um that's the work that you are doing in developer experience on react native side and let's move on to yet another uh, area and this will be the last one but i i wanted to talk specifically about it because like this can this actually gives me hope, let's say, or assurance that I uh, took a good path several years ago looking into React Native and going into React Native. Because right now we have two huge players investing huge, hugely in React Native space. We have you, Microsoft, and we also have Meta. So I want to talk with you about your involvement in React Native community and React Native uh, working group. Can you tell us how um, the administration of React Native works and what is the process between you, Meta, and like community of maintaining React Native and React Native community in general? Do we have three hours? Can I explain the entire thing? <laughs> uh, I, I'd rather, I'd much rather uh, have you do it briefly, as brief as you can with the complex subject yeah. like that. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, OK, so let's try to keep it as simple as we can. So Meta owns React Native. That's the easiest explanation. So they don't necessarily you know, need to worry about anything that they don't care about. Uh, that's why, for example, for the longest time, the releases have been done by the community, uh, like Mike Rabowski, me. Um, or, for example, why the React Native CLI is its own repository, because they don't use it internally. So basically, uh, because of their goals and their focus, there's always been this, this connection with the outside world, with how everyone else uses React Native. So to fill that gap, um, a new kind of concept has been created of the company partners. Basically, the idea here is that Meta was like, hey, by the way, companies using React Native, we recognize that some of you are really like big players are really trying to help. So let us give you like this partner status that comes along with some responsibilities and some, you know, also spotlight time in a way. And with that comes along the fact that we sometimes communicate, have meetings. Now there's a Every month, there's this basically these partner meetings where all these companies and Meta like kind of syncs up. Well, engineers from these companies, so it's not like anything like it's not PM level. It's just engineers kind of like chatting with each other, like, hey, by the way, we have this type of problems, and you know, trying to figure out ways that we can all collaborate to address these problems. For example, uh, right now, there's a new. Uh, effort that is starting that is called the Developer Experience Working Group, where basically us from Microsoft and engineers from Meta, we're trying to address some of the biggest pain points in the ecosystem, like debugging type things for TypeScript. Um, also, like we're trying to improve the situation on CI, um, the thing that I was mentioning at the start of the podcast. 
and also the situation with Metro. So there are basically, there's Meta that controls and decides on their own what they want. Then there's this second layer of like the partners where like these companies can sort of like have a voice and say certain things and contribute in certain ways. And then there's like the, the, the community aspect law. So everyone else that can contribute, submit PRs. And also an interesting tidbit to mention here is that uh, this partners definition, this core contributors definition is actually in the process of being rediscussed. If you go on the Rack Native repo, there is a document that um, is being discussed. There's this draft PR, which is called uh, like updating the ecosystem.md file or something like that, where Basically, mm-hmm. within this markdown file, there's the partner definition, there's the list of partners, there's the definition of core contributors. So people can also have a say in that. It's not a, like a secret conversation. It's out there. It's happening on that repo. Yeah, actually, one of the one. things that I love about React Native is when the new architecture was discussed, it, it was for everyone to see the discussion. You could actually go in there and uh, give your perspective, Try, try it out yourself even like a year ago or more than that even and like participate in the creation of new architecture and not being only a consumer of it. Yeah, and uh, actually two thoughts on this. So the first one is that uh, over the last six months, oh, uh, like in 2022, the, the React Native team at Meta has been trying to really improve um you know the turnaround time for prs like they have nicola they have ricardo like a few people from the london team here that are working really hard to try and make sure that they are active in the repo they're listening they're responding to issues so they deserve you know praise for that they are doing great work in to you know make sure that people can still feel like they're contributing like for example there was this engineer from the teams mobile app that figured out that there was basically two Android libraries, two dot .so libraries, so static libraries that were added to the APK that were kind of redundant. So he made a PR to to change that, to basically remove mm-hmm. the, the smaller one, which basically was already contained in the first one. And that led to an average of like removing 200 kilobytes from an average APK, which is mm-hmm. massive. And this yeah. was his first ever PR ever like imagine that like my first ever pr was like oh fixing a typo in this markdown file <laughs> yeah <laughs> the first pr of this engineer is like oh let me optimize the apk for every single application using react native out there in the world yeah. and within meta but like i would be so that? scared of actually oh, yeah. removing some file from like native, even though I am an Android developer, I would be so scared of removing like native file from the template. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And and it wasn't even a template; it was like literally in the build files. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. also that basically means you're also touching Facebook own code, and like yeah. potentially your improvement is also benefiting the Facebook app, for example. So mm-hmm. it, it's pretty wild, but um, it, it was basically merged in a week or something like that. So you know this is possible and even people that are trying their hand first time in open source if they have colleagues that pass out help them out like they have a chance of like still you know contributing to react native and the second yeah. thought that i wanted to share here in terms of like the transparency and seeing these discussions is uh, similarly to this developer experience working group there's a bundle working group that adam foxman which is a colleague of mine is um, is is managing over in the RNX Kit repo. Basically, if you go into RNX Kit repo, you click on the discussion tab. You'll see that a category is the bundle working group, and it's basically a once every month meeting with a few key companies like Expo, like Meta, like us, talking about the bundler situation. Our Metro needs to be improved. Our Metro needs to change, and the notes are all there, and also like the proposal and things like that. And a third as an example of this transparency and like trying to keep things in the open is that if you go on the discussion and proposal repository within the React Native org uh, on GitHub, you will find that there is a project there uh, that is basically keeping track of the collaboration between Meta and Microsoft on the desktop platforms. So 
React Native Windows, React Native Mac OS that we were mentioning earlier, they're mm -hmm. also used by Facebook within the Facebook Messenger app. So it's the, there is a level of collaboration there to ensure that you know all our desktop apps are uh, you know working well. So the coordination around like improvements to React Native Windows, React Native Mac OS, it's all like tracked in that project. So people can also take a look at that if they want. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for this brief. It was brief explanation of I tried. how <laughs> the administrative part of React Native ecosystem works. And to to close off our main topics, uh, I must reiterate that I'm so glad that I'm in this space that two biggest players in technology are also in and are investing in. So I can feel <laughs> secure. I can feel job secure right now. Uh, knowing that you are doing so many things there. Um, for the last question on this podcast, uh, I want to ask uh, something maybe out of the box, out of this specific topic, and ask you about the current trends that you are seeing in React Native and uh, what are you excited about in, in our technology? That, that, that's a great way, I think, to close it off. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on. Like, uh, I'm, as I was mentioning earlier, like, basically, part of my job is to keep an eye out and see what's happening and trying to make sure that it happens or, like, that we can do the first few steps that will help everyone else run. So right now, I think that one thing that is clear, like to go through going through conferences and talking to different people and like looking at trends on, for example, Twitter, is that it looks like everyone is more or less looking at this, uh, trying to chase this saint graal of like having web and mobile work well together. Yeah. Of course, at Microsoft, we we look at it more as like, can we make web desktop, mobile, and other platforms all work together. But in general, it seems that's something that is being worked on. Uh, in particular, I want to give a quick shout out to Nicholas from a Meta that web. Uh, is also the maintainer of Reckoning Web and recently opened an RFC to sort of like propose certain changes to uh, basically the UI layer of React Native so that the naming is more consistent between web and mobile. And I think that's a great step. I know that there's also some work that is being done around yoga because yoga currently is like not super maintained, but they're working on something else. And Meta is trying to communicate more around that. So for sure, there's something big coming up or like probably in the next six months, who knows, around this UI aspect of React Native that is very interesting. Uh, the new architecture, of course, is another big topic, something that we all I've been seeing coming up for a while now. Like I, I have a talk about uh, the new architecture where basically I, I joke about the fact that I've been saying that the new architecture is coming since January 2019. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Great talk it, it's finally up. Thank you. I was doing it at the React Native Rock Club meetup yeah, organized by Colstack. You can find it on React Native. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you can find it on <laughs> Colstack Engineers on YouTube. It's a, it's a great talk. You should yeah, the, the, exactly. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, because the new architecture moves so fast, it's likely that in a few months I will have to already like change some of the slides. But I think some of the core ideas that I'm trying to pass there are are still valid. And in particular, and this is why probably I'm also like a bit uh, cautiously optimistic about the new architecture is that it really needs to stick the landing, and that means that the community really needs to start playing around with it, really needs to start migrating the libraries to it, which is why like, we're also trying to say to more, more hey, just use React Native to sub. Like, if you use it to turn on the new architecture is one flag, and you can see if your example app, your library code on the example app works well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting next six months, probably. Uh, there's a lot more going on, of course. Like, for example, we are working a lot with Meta, you know, to improve in general the developer experience, as I was mentioning before. So it, it, I think we are probably, it's going to be interesting to, you know, 
to see in six months, in a year, like yeah. how are things? Uh, how's the situation for the average developer for you know for developing React Native? Because I really think that there is a lot of focus there right now, and I think things will you know turn out well. Yeah, I feel like this closing question is such a big and open subject that we could have uh, a separate series of podcasts just about it. So maybe we will, maybe we will. I, I will definitely want to have you on show again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on this the React Native show me. podcast about uh, React Native at Microsoft. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. It's been great. And yeah, if anyone has any more questions, of course, they can reach out to me. I'm at Calset everywhere you may want to find me. So, you know, my DMs are open. Feel free to shoot a message there. And thanks for having me, Kolstak. It's always lovely. Yeah.